On Earth, if you want to know what the weather is like, then you can look out the window or go outside. Um, but that only gets you so far. What about if you want to know what the weather's going to be like for the weekend when you plan to go fishing or, or, or go somewhere with friends? So to do that, what we need to be able to do is predict what the atmosphere is going to do. So in those cases, we, we have to create a model, essentially, in, in this case of Earth's atmosphere. And what we essentially do is we understand the physics of how winds move or, or how heating occurs, and we put that into a piece of software. So if you imagine this is the Earth, we'd essentially, in many cases, break the atmosphere up into lots of little grid cells, all the little boxes, and then we make calculations in each of those boxes about what the heating is doing and how the wind is moving material around, and also what processes are occurring inside those sort of grid boxes. And, and one of those models is called a GCM, or a, or a global circulation model. And there's um, a, a range of these, and the one we use is the one from the UK Met Office. And we've, that sort of GCM, or that model, contains several key components. Now in the case of the Earth, we, we need to understand the interaction of the land surface, the sea, the oceans, the sea ice, and the atmosphere. But in a much more simplified case, in the studies we use for extrasolar planets, we actually really can't concentrate on only the atmosphere itself. And it can be broken down into really three key components. We need to understand how the sunlight, or the starlight in that case, is interacting with the atmosphere and heating the atmosphere. That's what drives the atmosphere, and it's what drives the climate. If you take Earth's case again, we have sort of preferential heating at the equator, so it's kind of hotter at the equator, and then we have a much colder pole, and that temperature gradient is what really drives the Earth's circulations. So the winds will respond to that and try to redistribute the heat. And the same thing happens on exoplanets as well. So we need to understand that process. The second process we need to understand, other than the heating, is how the atmosphere actually responds. And that's what we'd call dynamics. So we need to be able to model the dynamics of the atmosphere, how the wind shifts the heat around. And then the final component, which is really important, is chemistry. If you have different temperatures and pressures, the actual composition or the, the species inside the atmosphere might change. They react together, they do different things, and they, they can also then affect how your atmosphere behaves. The final thing, which is really the toughest thing, is clouds. So clouds are really difficult to, to understand and to model. They're one of the leading uncertainties in, in Earth's climate modeling. And we're finding them very prevalent in exoplanets, and indeed they're very prevalent in planets in our solar system as well. So we need to understand how clouds form, how they move around, and how they dissipate. So that's a kind of model and, and how we use it to predict Earth's climate. Once we've got all this kind of physics and dynamics and chemistry, etc., in our model, and we know that it works well because it gives us a, an answer, a good answer for our weather, we can then run it forward and start to predict what the weather or the climate like, might be like in the future. Well, we can actually study the atmosphere of exoplanets now for dozens and dozens of, of different planets. And we only have a, a, a small glimpse. We can only learn a few things from observations like with the Hubble Taste Space Telescope or even ground-based telescopes. And what they're telling us is that exoplanets are very diverse. They have some why do planets look different? Why do some planets have clouds and other planets don't? Why do some planets have sodium in the atmospheres and some of them don't? So in order to make sense of all the observations, make sense of everything we're seeing in planets out there, we need a physical model to understand what is basically going on in the planet um, itself and to understand why we see the diversity that we do. Now fortunately, if you look across the planets in our solar system, although they're quite diverse, in, a, in at least an idealized sense, they're just big balls of gas, or at least the atmosphere section is. So there's no reason why we can't apply the same physics or the same model to those different planets, and also then start to learn and understand a bit more about their atmospheres. Now here, although prediction is still important, determining what the weather will be like in the future, on a, on a planet inside the solar system that isn't Earth, that's not our key aim. Our key aim in that case is to try to understand more about how the atmosphere itself works, how it's driven, and, and what are the important kind of effects. So that's great, and, and, and lots and lots of work has been put into that over the years. And of course, since the discovery of exoplanets, uh, we've been confronted with a huge diversity of planet types, a huge diversity of atmospheres, um, 
a huge uh, range of, of heating rates or how close a planet is to its star, for example. So what we've tried to do here at Exeter and a few other groups across the world have been trying to do this is take one of these models that's set up really for Earth or originally made for Earth and try to adapt it for this huge range. So here's a, 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 another example. So one of the sort of most common types of exoplanets, at least in our detections, are these things called hot Jupiters, which are very close to their, their sort of parent star and their kind of Jupiter in size. So what we have to deal with here is very, very intense heating on one side of the planet and then a very cold side on the other, often uh, up to sort of a few a thousand or so degrees temperature difference between each side. Now for all intents and purposes, the rest of this planet is very Jupiter-like, sort of gaseous, it's very similar to Jupiter in many ways, but it has this key major difference of this huge sort of heating and sort of temperature gradient. So we've adapted some of our models to these, these types of planets to try to explore more about how their atmospheres work. Now observations can tell us a lot about this planet. They can tell us its mass, its radius, so its kind of size. They give us an estimate perhaps of its gravity as well, how, what sort of downward force the atmosphere is feeling. We can even do things like work out what the uh, temperature gradients might be across this sort of day to night side. So using all of that information, we can feed that into one of our models, use those kind of glimpses, I guess, of the atmosphere, feed it into one of our models, and then run the model and understand the bits we can't see, if you like. Try to run the model, make sure it gives us the right answer to match the observations. Does it give us the right um, sort of species in the right locations? But then use the model to sort of flesh out the detail, I suppose, and understand more about the, the deeper atmosphere, for example, or how it evolves. So we can set these, uh, these models up, run them, and then try to learn a little bit about exoplanets using them. Well, the real power in a model, when it's the right model, is it has to have some predictive power. So we want to use these models and really refine them so that when we look at a new planet, we can predict in advance, well, for instance, if it's going to be cloudy or not, or if there's going to be sodium in the atmosphere or not. And even down the line, when we look at other planets like Earth, we're going to want to know if, for instance, are the conditions right for life or not. And so we really need basic physical models that are the right models. And this is where the science comes in. We can test different models against the observations, see ones, which ones are right, see which ones are wrong. Now this is going to be vital, obviously, because the more exoplanets we find, the more diversity we find, the more we understand about atmospheres, how atmospheres work. And we've really learned, I think, as a field or a new field in the last... Ten, 10 years essentially that we don't understand atmospheres very well. We understand Earth's relatively well, but we don't understand atmospheres as a family very well. And this is going to be vital because as we push to try and find more and more exoplanets, in particular more Earth-like exoplanets, we only really, at the beginning at least, will get glimpses of these things. So we really need a, a theory and a model framework to try to understand more about them.